Hi, I'm Sam Sells, and welcome to my podcast, Clean Money. I like to say investing matters, and my show is to talk with everyday folks that are not only creating great success, but making an impact in society and improving the lives of others. That is my mission, and I want to share my stories and others with you. Welcome to Clean Money. Everyone, thank you again for joining us today with another great episode of Clean Money Podcast, where we talk about making a difference in the world through our investments of time and resources. And one person who has had an amazing impact in the world, traveled over 100,000 miles, spoke at over 70-something engagements, is Lee Brown. She uses her decades of real estate experience to help everyone from early career to highly, highly seasoned agents. Yes, even highly seasoned agents need help um, to build or rebuild their professional presence and confidence by helping them define and communicate their value proposition expertly. Her goal is that each real estate agent who is a realtor member becomes an impactful presence in their community in the process. And she knows today's agents and brokers face an unprecedented amount of pressure to stand out in a competitive market. That is so incredibly true. Um, you also know that the security to build and maintain solid client relationships starts with just one step uh, saying hi, which you would think people would know, but even I forget that sometimes. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to say hi. Um, and then you lose out on your opportunity, right? So she's a best-selling author of three powerful business books. Lee excitedly shares her expertise with anyone looking for ways to ignite their passions and create their outcomes they want. You're on a mission to helping others, which is why I've been so excited for you to come join this podcast, because this is what we talk about is the impact we can have in other people's life. You got grit and passion. Um, I love grit and to motivate everyone around you to strive for more. Lee, thank you so much for joining the pod. Well, it's an honor to be here and I love what you're working on. So I'm excited for this conversation. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. So um, you and I both share a, uh, a big aversion to introductions about ourselves. We're not uh, interested in the, in the, the highlights. We just want to be able to share our message of making a difference. So tell me uh, a little bit, because you do this a lot now. You do share your message a lot, um, and it's very specific to real estate. So can you give just the viewers a little bit what you focus on the most right now, uh, particularly in this crazy market? Well, that would be what day it is, what I focus on the most, because as a good real estate professional, I don't have a lot of focus. I tend to squirrel a lot. And so I have a lot of projects going at any given time. Good, yeah. But I will say that my focus right now, there's a couple of things. One of them is replacing myself, which we all have to be thinking about that. And often in business life, we do talent development of other people in a different space. I'm looking at it now is how do I find the talent that can come in and take the stage from me? Because I need to hear from somebody else. The growth that I'm looking for is going to, it's coming from somebody else right now. So I need to to get filled back up. So I started a few years ago, I started a speaker boot camp to help ed- bring up and educate the next level of real estate instructors. Because when I first wanted to teach other people how to do real estate professionally, Nobody would show me the ropes. And I was like, that's ridiculous. We are not in a place of scarcity. We should live by abundance. So in that effort, I'm trying to give everything I've learned to the next generation. And now I get to watch them all come on the stage and shine in their own spotlights, which is amazing. I love that. But my other projects have to do with how I can build my community up as a professional realtor outside of those signs in yards. And I think a lot of real estate pros they, they get a little bored, although they won't admit it. The really good ones, they know the mechanics of getting a house on the market, professionally marketed and getting it sold. They know the mechanics of getting a buyer educated, helping them figure out how to navigate whatever market conditions we're in, and they get the job done. And then because you get really good at it, it's in that Malcolm Gladwell space. Did you read the book Outliers where he talks did, about yes, yeah. 10,000 hours of expertise yeah. We see the same thing in real estate. And when a realtor gets to that point, you know, what do you do next? And so what I'm focused on is how do I help people in the real estate space look up and out from what they're selling? Because they, of course, got to pay their bills. There's nothing wrong with being compensated for your professional work. But how do they impact those neighborhoods and they impact the community and impact regulatory affairs and impact legislative burdens? And how do they drive good public policy decisions built on real estate because the place the country's in right now 
is getting very fragmented, fractured, and broken. And realtors are uniquely qualified to be boots on the ground to start bringing some of those answers back in. So I want to be one of those voices that helps show them a framework for doing that. And then they can fill in all the gaps and do it themselves, which is what real estate pros are great at. So it's two fronts right there, while also I have two teenagers in the house and I'm really hoping to launch them into the world and that I have not raised a flock of a-holes. I really want really <laughs> nice kids and I feel like I'm almost there. So that's my other goal in life. As a as a parent of a teenager, I share that. Like, I really hope I didn't just send out um, a huge punk into the world. <laughs> we have to be hopeful that the foundation's intact, even if there's a hole in the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's already way too many of those people out there. They uh, they remind me every once in a while, send me an email. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're that one. Yeah, you're thank that you one. for reminding me. So uh, I love that you talked about the fracture of society and, and the impact that realtors have inside communities. And I, I've known this myself, like realtors who have become good friends of ours. Um, they, you know, they help people find those distressed assets. I remember on one of your podcasts, you talked about uh, it's, you know, sellers don't want, always want just money, the most money they can make. Sometimes they don't want any money. They just want to get rid of the thing. And, and because of X, Y, Z, pick your death, divorce, disease, the three D's real estate, uh, you know, anything like that. Sometimes they just want to get rid of it. They, you know, they are no longer able to take care of it. They want somebody to rebeautify that property. Or um, they've lovingly taken care of a home. They want the right family to take it, even though, you know, so it's not always about the dollar. There's impact and you create impact by bringing the right people to the right places, um, rejuvenating communities, and then uh, policy and, and so, so much that realtors can do. And I love that you take that holistic view. It's not just about money. That impact that you can have is significant, particularly when you know what you, you're doing because you've been doing it for a while. Well, I think that's where a lot of people have minimized the impact that real estate professionals can have. And I, I do blame the mainstream media in Hollywood for that, because when they portray a real estate person on television or in the movies, mm -hmm. they're either a slut like Annette Benning was in American Beauty, where she was banging the king of real estate in that god awful movie. Or it's Phil Dunphy in Modern Family, who most of the time is a buffoon, except for the one episode where he was talking to a for sale by owner, and he had his um, wife's uh, the dad, his wife's dad's wife, the um, beautiful lady with the long brown hair. I don't know the TV program, but he was showing her the house, and he definitely portrayed the value of a realtor. But it was that one time, and look at TV selling Sunset; they're all fake million dollar listing they're not really showing you the kind of work that a day-to-day -day practicing realtor does right. that they never get compensated for because a lot of the work that pros do is in helping somebody make a decision and sometimes a decision is don't buy this one so mm -hmm. we'll find you something else and they work for a long time before they ever get to compensation and you won't see that on hgtv in 30 minutes right. on house hunters where they look at three and buy one so there's definitely a misconception about what realtors are doing in their day-to-day -day practice, but then what they bring to the table is crazy because they look at a house and they say, you know what, what's the impact of the roads here? Where's the school bus stop? Is there a stop sign or is anything happening with water and sewer? What's the scoop at the pool over here? This neighbor's house is boarded up. What's happening with this place being cleared over here? Is there any industrial development? What are the airlines doing? What's happening over here with retail and grocery stores? And so they're noticing all of those factors that impact that one property. And they're able to actually bring it all into one narrative, which is fascinating when you look at how in depth that process can be. Now, I'll, I'll be very fair here. I know not all real estate professionals are made equal. I know a bunch of oh, media yeah. and don't look at it that way. So let me just put that in place right now. But the ones that are highly skilled, I think every investor out there who has a realtor they trust would, would defend them to the teeth and say, mine does everything and beyond. And I know I can trust their input because they are my boots on the ground. And then the other person who comments on this episode says, well, my agent sucked and they were terrible and they were lazy and got paid. All right, I get it. But the ones that are great, they hold all the keys. And in fact, we were having a conversation this morning in Charlotte. I'm, I'm in Concord, just outside of Charlotte. And it was the same conversation happening in all over the country. Where are we going to get more houses? There's just no supply. Yeah. And how are we going to fix this 
affordability situation because we have the price spectrum that used to look like this has come to this. And yeah. the stat in Charlotte was that only 50% of our public can can buy property at all right now because there's just a gap between what they're being paid in wages and what rents are and what houses cost. And so as real estate pros, we have to be at that table because we can say, well, don't listen to the person over here squeaking about we have to save this tree. And I, I love we had a developer on the call and he said, to the lady fussing about saving the one tree. He's like, so what do I tell the mom sleeping in the car with her two kids that the tree is more important than she is? We have to figure out that balance. Mm -hmm. And I think realtors are uniquely qualified to look at that balance. But for too many years, realtors get busy putting a sign in the yard and they haven't gone into those really boring and dreadful planning and zoning and decision-making rooms. But the more we're in there, the more we can find holistic decision, good holistic solutions. And so that's where, all of this really adds up. And for investors, I think it's even more, and, and I love investors who don't like realtors. I mean, I get it. They, they had yeah, one, sure. one, one time, it's like that one time you drank tequila in college and you never touched a margarita again. It's that bad <laughs> memory and I get it. But then you look at how much we do know and we have the insights on the local market and you've got to value what the end goal is for everybody. So back to what you mentioned about not everybody's goal is monetary. I got tickled because one of the investors that I hang out with on Twitter, which is my favorite dumpster fire, by the way, I don't know why I enjoy having my blood pressure up, but I love Twitter for that. And he was cold calling on storage unit owners because he's an investor of storage units. Yeah. And I don't own any, but I'm fascinated by the business. I'm a low risk profile person. So I have to learn a long time before I jump in. Yeah. It was cold calling, found this old lady who owned a bunch of properties. She lived in Oklahoma and he called her and she said, you can call me all you want, but I just sold everything to some city slicker who paid me too much. And now I'm on the beach in California. And this guy's response was good for her, which yeah. I love that he had the response of she got what she wanted. She's in her beach condo. It worked out for her. But then you look at the comment thread, which is a terrible idea. Just life advice. Yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and a bunch of these jerks are like, she probably gave it away. Somebody didn't pay enough for that. And she got robbed and like, not necessarily, dude. She got what she wanted and yeah. she's happy. So you don't have the right to go in and rain on her parade. And by the way, you should also be admiring the fact that the guy you're responding to was doing the hard work about their calling people looking for opportunities to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've, you know, started posting a lot of stuff on social media and just some of the comments are like, you know, really like, we're, we're cleaning this place up. You can see the difference that we've made and the residents lives and everything else. And, and now you're calling me a Karen. Right? Like, That's the uh -huh. same kid who wasn't picked for the dodgeball team. He's still mad all these years later is all I can figure. Yeah. That's, that's all I can figure too. And, you know, I, I've come to learn that there's really, really different types of investors and people who get used to being in the stock market. Um, they come into real estate and they just expect, you know, instantaneous gratification. They can look at a, a chart and see that it's up or down. They, you know, and that's all, all in their entire investment world. All they see are the numbers going up or down. And they don't realize that those numbers represent a corporation and people and humans and people are working hard and everything else. Like, I don't care about any of those people. I just want to know my number goes up or down. And if that's it, you know, I don't want you to invest with me. I care about how people. Much how much energy are they expending every day? staring at the account, watching it fluctuate when they're not retiring today. You're not pulling your money out today. So stop staring at it. What else could you be doing with that time? Yeah. I mean, could you be in that planning and zoning meeting you don't want to be in, but you need to know the players so that a year from now, when you want to bring something interesting to the table, you've already started the relationships. Instead, they're not spending the time wisely, essentially investing for the future. They're sitting here staring at an account line that's not controllable. And it's not, it's not controllable. You said that corporations are people too, because not in the, the big picture of corporations should be allowed to do whatever they want to do because they're people. Right. But I mean, we, we do forget that when we celebrate a company having a low stock day, it's an opportunity for investors, but somebody got surplus. My husband works for AT&T and they don't call it layoffs anymore. They call it surplusing, oh, which is very Orwellian. But we know that when their numbers get wonky, that's the first thing that company does. So as an investor, you, you can see a buying opportunity, but I don't know that you always celebrate a buying opportunity like the last the recession, right? 
There were buying opportunities for real estate investors, but they represented lost houses to people who, frankly, I don't think were given enough education about the mortgage process, or they probably could have figured out how to hold on, but Mm -hmm. they got slammed into a house without the proper foundation, and then the investors made out on it, but I don't don't know that that's something we want to celebrate. Yeah, I I, I like that comment. Yeah, go ahead. What did Brad Pitt say in um, The Big Short? Do you remember that? It was... (laughs) He only had it was you know it's probably the best explainer of the Great Recession and the tranches, but he made that comment when they were realizing it was going to happen that every t- that when they celebrate the market moving by X, it's this many people losing their house. It was probably the best Brad Pitt moment ever, <laughs> for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you. So now, right now in the market, there's a. So residential real estate and commercial real estate are usually on similar tracks, right? Usually they go up together, they go down together sometimes. Right now they're in opposite directions. Commercial real estate is in a dumpster fire that's floating down a river and, you know, you can't put out, it's it's just a ginormous mess. And I'm seeing uh, young syndicators, um, commercial real estate uh, owners and the top cream of the crop, Blackstones and and others losing, losing yeah, cream of the crop. Okay, the biggest. No, that was Blackstone. That's Blackstone, <laughs> State Street, and Vanguard. That's yeah. right. <laughs> my devil horns. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to this, you want to you don't want to look at the YouTube video. So, um, I'm watching these companies walk away from properties. And I'm watching young syndicators do the same thing and some very experienced syndicators, but they don't know how to save their property or they got into it in the hype. They bought a class A property. um, They syndicated it. They added all these costs and big fees. And now they can't save the deal because they didn't buy low. And when I made it through the 2008 crisis, we did so because we bought single family homes at $50,000 a piece. And instead of selling them for 130, we sold them for 110 and we still made money. Uh, but, or we turned them into rentals and held on to them and still made money, cash flow, you know, every month. And here we are now in this crisis and people are losing their minds and walking away because they don't know what they're doing uh, or they don't know how to save. And they're too embarrassed to go ask, like, what do I do? Uh, That's the key right there is they're too embarrassed to ask. And I don't know where we got so sideways as humans that we don't have the resilience to say, all right, I need to bounce from this. I mean, whether you like him or hate him, President Trump went bankrupt twice and Mm -hmm. he didn't look at that as an end of a journey. It was just, all right, let me turn the page and let's go to the next chapter. And when you look at people that have resilience, they can take a market condition and figure it out. So all those people with commercial properties that they're looking at right now with a sense of giant dismay should be asking themselves, all right, what are the adaptive reuse possibilities here? And that granted, adaptive reuse, and for those of y'all that aren't super nerds, that just means taking a commercial property and maybe refitting it into residential because there's still a massive supply shortage on the residential side. If I owned commercial buildings, I'd be the one in planning and zoning. Again, talking to the municipal officials about what can we do for some conditional grants here so that we can make some opportunities for housing out of the commercial building? There's ways to make it work if you're willing to look at it. But if you panic over market conditions and walk away, you're A, not learning anything, and you're B, not supporting your community with a solution instead of leaving behind another empty building. There's there's always a way. The question is the person who's going to decide to find a creative solution and the person who says, screw it, I'll go do something else. But yeah. there's also a reminder to all of us on syndications, which I, again, I'm low risk profile, can't do syndications. I've almost done it three times. <laughs> you better know your syndicators and you should have interviewed them and met them in person and had a cup of coffee with them. And you should know those partners if you're going to put your dollars in with theirs. Otherwise, you might be teaching your dollars bad habits by letting them hang out with with bad dollars who are going to teach it to sneak out late at night and smoke a cigarette behind the building. Yeah. Your money should hang out with smart money. And so you can make those decisions. There's great syndicators out there who are absolutely value adding. They are putting great deals together and they just need somebody to come in with them. Find those guys. But some of the ones that can't survive this market, I won't be sad that they go away, to be very honest. Yeah. 
And the reason I did put my devil horns on about Black Rock and I also do it about State Street and Vanguard, first of all, I think ESG is destroying our investing climate. But the other thing I would tell you is that nobody should own that much housing stock or real estate stock in the country. The beauty of how our country has grown and built is that everybody's got their chance at their little corner of the American dream. And here in Charlotte, those institutional investors own somewhere around 30% of our housing stock. That's a three zero, which means that a large portion of our opportunity is held by a nameless, faceless money blob somewhere else. And I'm not okay with that. I like it when my neighbors who don't look like me, don't talk like me, aren't from here, but have similar goals in mind, which is I want financial stability for whatever version of family I have. And I want to hold it for the future. That's who I won't own in property. And so it takes that where are we going and how do we get their mindset? And then the opportunities are endless right now. But when you mentioned the divergence in the residential and commercial market, there's also a real space here for the numbers people to pay better attention to real estate. It's one thing I wish about my people that they were better at reading and paying attention to overall economic trends and numbers because the problem in the commercial space is the debt. It's the fact that they have that same problem the banks do where the underlying debt being held in treasuries. Terrible idea because the yields are all messed up right now. I'd say 99.9% .9 of real estate pros don't understand a yield curve, but they need to because that's what's going to cause the continued problems in the sector because inflation's not gone. Now, all of that just means if you understand that we're not done with our issues yet, you start looking for opportunities. And yeah. that's exciting to me. I, I, I love adaptive reuse. I can't say it enough. There are really cool things that could happen with some of our outdated properties that could become something really innovative and even provide some new micro communities wherever we live. But it's it's also why I buy B and C properties myself because I'm never as strung out as the A people. <laughs> I'm I'm with you, yeah, and that and that trickle down um, usually works, except in COVID, where you know all of a sudden the government steps in and you know people don't have to pay rents anymore, and then you're like, I mean, that's the worst to... policy decision ever. I mean, I think every landlord I know would have said okay if there had been a hardship test, but to be no hardship test is what hamstrung the whole investment market that was it so we got we had guys like walking around telling all the other tenants hey guys you don't have to pay rent anymore yep and we're like did you did you lose your job is there something we can help with because we can go find a charity we do this all the time we always help people with rent if they need it always like, we love always. our tenants. it's in our best interest to do so and plus we actually legitimately care about humans um but no it's just like no uh president said we don't have to pay rent anymore and I, I just thought are we really doing this are we is really this, doing is this really happening and I know two years from now there's gonna be investors saying well that never really happened and you're like come on I mean that no COVID actually did happen I, I don't know if you know this but um but we also see it with the student loan debacle. They had those payments on pause now for three years they can't start on back up I mean let's be realistic about it they've yeah. backed themselves into a complete corner because you can't restart something that's been paused for that long. And that's the same issue we had on the eviction moratorium. The tenants who took advantage of the system have also torn up the properties they were in because they were they were given free license to do so because you couldn't evict them. Yeah. And frankly, I mean, all of, I, all of my tenants paid. I didn't have any problem issues, but because my property manager and I talked to all of our tenants, like you were saying, we, we like providing good housing for our tenants. We also know in the supply situation in this market, none of them wanted to get run off because they got nowhere to go. So the market has helped, but it also helps that we take care of people. But you can't fix bad habits when you start them. And that's where you talk about really smart uses of your money. Your money should be educating everybody around it. So when you're a landlord, you educate your tenants, teach them how to be property owners one day. If yeah. As a realtor, when I'm talking to a first time buyer, I always refer to that first house as the first house in their empire that I want them to think about buying properties on the regular so they can build up their own financial freedom. But I got to educate them on, on how everything works in the process. And it's a it's a failure of our policymakers and it's a failure of our education system that we're not building up, first of all, the pride of ownership and building up the desire for ownership. Mm -hmm. And then we give them the tools to get there that we think about. You know, what does a credit score mean? Why do you say, why do you live within your budget? Well, what is a budget? You know, why do you say, what's the bank account for? Wait a minute, what are stocks for? How do you retire? All we do is bring people up through a broken system, get them graduated, send them out into the world, 
where their employer takes out some FICA and takes out some Social Security, takes out some 401k right. if they're lucky, so they can have maybe an account later that they aren't even aware of. I, I would like to see everybody who gets that paycheck know what all those line items mean. Yeah, to me, that's that's clean money, right? You, When you eat clean food, you know what the feel food better. is and you feel better, right? You know what's going into your body. And when you spend your money, you should know what's happening. I think 401k is one of the biggest scams in American history. It's just like, okay, I'm going to well, go. Who's, who's got the biggest one, Sam? Oh, would it be Vanguard? See? <laughs> <laughs> right. Hell yeah. All roads lead back to my tinfoil hat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have no idea how many fees are coming out there. You have no idea where that money's going. You know, and <sighs> it is frustrating because I do think most people are smarter than they give themselves credit for. They they act like they're not able to learn the intricacies of the equities market. They they are. They're capable of it. Their grandparents were. Their grandparents were farmers. Mm -hmm. and know how to invest in blue chip stocks. But we've now told the public that they should just trust a nameless third party. No, don't just trust a nameless third party. And, and if you want to start with a 401k, that's fine. But figure out what those funds are, figure out who's running those funds and look at the fees. And then ask yourself, do I max this out to get the employer match? Answer is probably yes, because you don't want to leave money on the table. But then above and beyond that, what else can you be doing? And if you start paying attention to who's getting which ones of your dollars, you start to realize that this is why a lot of people diversify with real estate because there is a an opportunity there to see, feel, and touch what you're purchasing and provide a benefit to somebody else in the community when you purchase it. Because I, I will never not look at investment real estate as something less than an opportunity to help the community. And especially right now, go back to the affordability crisis going on. The people that offer the lowest market rent opportunities are mom and pop landlords. And it's not your big hedge funds, your oh, big no. BlackRock State Street Vanguard. They want that A-class stuff because it's low maintenance and it's low headache. But the people who need housing are the lower end of the economic scale. And just because they're the lower end of the scale doesn't mean they shouldn't have a roof that doesn't leak and windows that don't work and heat and air that's not operable. So the you, that that's you, the viewer, the listener, you who are thinking about how to invest in real estate, when you buy that little inexpensive duplex and you make sure it's not a disgusting mess, mm -hmm. you've provided two affordable housing opportunities to two neighbors who need somewhere to go. And so don't let anybody tell you that you're house hoarding because some of the language around real estate investing is getting really, really nasty. You're not hoarding a house. You're giving somebody else an opportunity to get their start. And when you give them their start and they get moved in, a really good investor leaves a little note that says, if you want to talk about a pathway to owning, I'm open to that. And don't pressure anybody because not everybody wants it, but you should let people know there's a chance they could own something one day. And yeah. that's, that's going to build them up. And when you build people up, they accomplish a lot more. And then we have this opportunity to get people back into that American spirit of creating solutions and entrepreneurism. And what's always been best about us is to go out and forge a new path. And our tenants should have that opportunity too, but they don't get there unless somebody's renting them a great place. That's right. Um, contrary to belief, you don't, your daddy doesn't have to own a bank for you to become successful and that's what America is really all about, um, you know, and, and I really, really appreciate your thoughts there. That's exactly what we do. And my, my company is we focus on affordable housing, distressed places, 50% occupancy, 6% occupancy and renovate and clean. And we put, you know, just at one complex, you know, well over a hundred units back on the market. That's a hundred homes. And it's naturally affordable. So we have, you know, lower income people in there and it's, it's amazing. So ESG, like when I look at that, I'm thinking, okay, so this is just a title that people use for us. Governance is huge. You have to have good governance, but it's not so that I can put a tag on a wall and get an extra benefit. It's because I need to provide good governance to my residents. That's a different yes. matter altogether. Um, and but it's you look been, at the E yeah. part of that, though, too, Sam, don't overlook that because the property you bought is not going to be up to current environmental world class lead kind of standards. The older buildings just aren't, but they're not falling down. They're not worthless either. 
And so if you look at the guidelines of the ESG movement, it would say to tear that down and rebuild it with something that's got the right kind of insulation and plumbing and electrical and windows and roof. And that sounds great, but that takes the cost here, which means the housing's now out of reach for all those hundred families that you put in there. And so it's not to say that we don't take care of what we have. But I'm just going to suggest that the rules that are coming from the elites are not always what's best for the individual community, because that building, those hundred families, I mean, how fast did you have a wait list on it? Was it about the time y'all started the reno and people watched the reno happening? They started saying, let me know when it's ready. We had over 60 people on the waiting list, nonstop yep. for well over a year. And we kept filling units and people kept getting on the waiting list. It was incredible this is tulsa oklahoma and you know all i have all these institutions and they're like oh we don't like tulsa i'm like that's your problem i have 60 something people on my wait list how many do you have on yours right i mean oh we guess don't what? Have- there's humans in tulsa oh yeah, I live somewhere. Bang, bang, yeah. Bang. <laughs> there's a reason why that com- economy has always been strong there you know it's not going anywhere it's not declining it's actually getting better because industries are starting to pay attention like i pay less taxes in oklahoma it's a lot less in salaries because I mean you can buy a three thousand square foot mansion for five hundred grand, um, and it's like oh you know, and Oklahoma's nice. Exactly, little yeah. stability goes a long way. Yeah, it goes a long way. So I <laughs> we definitely have gone over time. Lee, this has been <laughs> just a blast. I yeah, know we could go talk. down a thousand different rabbit holes. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just you know you brought up a couple other things and. And that I just want to point out to the viewers, society, politicians, society has learned social media, us versus them mentality. And so that us versus them mentality was fantastic for people like Hitler. Um, Modern politicians have learned that if I can vilify the other side and take maybe what is true, maybe there's a weakness there or something that the other side did that you don't agree with. But if I can turn that into something horrendous all of a sudden jews are terrible and they must be exterminated right and if you feel like we should get rid of all the republicans on the on or all the democrats or all whatever um and i'm like they're all the same i mean well if you're saying get rid of all you're part of the problem right you're part of the problem right you're building in tulsa right so the the way we're fragmented right now we want to burn somebody to the ground if they're not perfect That building wasn't perfect. It didn't need to be burned to the ground. It needed to be brought back to life. And so when you go pay attention to something and bring it back to life, suddenly it's really scalable and expansive because now it went from low occupancy to full occupancy and full occupancy of good, happy people who are now in a community together. They probably know each other now. And that wouldn't have happened if that building had been demolished and brought to the ground. So maybe instead of bringing each other to our knees, we should be lifting each other up. Yeah, totally different, right? So that's why, like, I just find that I'm a uh, unicorn is probably not the right word, but we're just so different than the way so many people think because it's like I'm willing to go do the heavy lifting, the hard stuff, the more risky things because I actually care about humans, and you can make a lot of money doing this. Um, and then you can do things with your money. You have more freedom when you have money to play with, and it's not about. Yeah. Laying in a bathtub like Scrooge McDuck, because a lot of people position investors that way who are doing value add projects. But if you don't make money on a project, then you can't go do something else for another yeah. project. And so it's it's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that can feed more in your community. Just like mm-hmm. if you have nothing, you can give nothing. But if you have something, you can give more. That's right. Abundance. You have to create. You have to receive talents. You have to be able to then go forth and share them. But a, a poor person handing another poor person a sandwich, very nice thing to do, but it's not repeatable. Um, it's not sustainable. And, you know, somebody's still hungry. Real estate is. <laughs> yeah. Repeatable and sustainable. Repeatable and sustainable. That's why I'm here. <laughs> not stocks or any of those kind of things, because it's just gambling in my in my view. I know there's smarter ways to do it, but... Thank you so much for joining the show today. I love uh, I love your thoughts and your passion because it is genuine. It is who you are. And for heaven's sakes, people, we need more, more like Lee Brown and what you're doing and what you're trying. And seeing the big picture is not just about dollars. So if you could, Lee, please tell um, 
our audience how they can find you and reach you. Well, I'm Lee Brown on my website and on most social media. Sometimes Thomas is in the middle because that's my maiden name. And also there's a famous Australian rugby player named Lee Brown. And so I couldn't get all my handles everywhere. It's very frustrating. But if a (laughs) spammer or a spoofer messages you and offers to teach you about crypto, that's not me. If they ask you to pay in Bitcoin, that's not me. So just spoiler alert on that. But I'd Amazon gift cards. Yeah. That. So I'm like, and I'm not going to go run out and buy five gift cards real quick because I'm in a meeting. That wasn't me either. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't renew your Norton antivirus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ah, but I might give you a little Bible scripture. I might give you some insights on real estate. And that's what I try to do on my social channels. So I'm delighted to connect. And if you are interested in investing in the Charlotte market, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that I love investors. And so you can call anytime, ringy dingy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I love that. Uh, authenticity is fantastic. Again, everyone, thank you for joining Clean Money and tune in next time, Lee. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure your links are in the show notes. And I look forward to talking to you again. Same. You can come on my podcast sometime. We'll do a swap. Yeah, let's do that. I'm I'm excited. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. If you enjoy the show, please I would appreciate it if you would leave a five-star review and tell us your thoughts about what Lee has said and impact investing and real estate. We'll talk to you all soon. Goodbye for now. Thank you for tuning in to Clean Money, where we talk about sustainable investing that improves society. We are passionate about creating great investment returns to investors who want to use their money to make a positive social impact in the world. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd appreciate a five-star review. And if you are interested in making your investing matter, please connect with us at wildmountaincapital.com. Or you can find me, Samuel Sells, on LinkedIn, on Twitter at Sells underscore Samuel, on Instagram at Clean Money Sam, or on Facebook. And finally, make your investing matter.